Last week, we began kind of the second section in our 12-week study around Christ of the church. And last week, we began to look at the provisions of the church that Christ gives individually to each individual believer, as well as to the church universal and the local church. And last week, we saw that Christ individually at salvation as a sovereign work of the Spirit imparts or distributes a unique spiritual gift blend to each individual believer. And as we saw last week, that that individual gift blend that is unique to you is to be used alongside other believers in the church to then build up the church and to do the ministry, as we'll see, of the church today. And this is in line with God's design for the church. As we think about designs and the the function of designs, Blueprints, historically, have been crucial in both the construction and the ongoing structural integrity of any sound structure. Through the rendering of blueprints, tradesmen across all kinds of disciplines, whether they be an architect, an electrician, a plumber, can come together to ensure the structure being built will be formed to the exact specifications that the architect intended. And it will be able to, in its integrity, stand up against the scrutinies of elements and of time. Whether it is a home, a massive skyscraper, a large shipping vessel, or an aircraft, for over 250 years, blueprints served as the universal standard and provided people across all languages and trades the ability to come together independently yet work together to build any structure set forth by the architect. Spiritually speaking, God the Creator, in His infinite wisdom, has set forth a blueprint for His church. As we have seen over the last few weeks, He has detailed how it is to be built, how it is to be structured, how it is to function, what it is to accomplish, and as we'll see today, who He has chosen to lead. But unlike blueprints that have been replaced in modern times by better digital renderings, God's blueprint for his church will never become obsolete. It is the same blueprint that he assigned to the church in the first century that we are to follow today. It doesn't matter if a church is a few weeks old, like ours, or if a church is 30 years old or 300 years old. It doesn't matter what experience that you've had in the past with other experiences on what worked or what didn't work. The church, as designed by Christ, is designed so that it cannot be improved upon through man's own imagination or ingenuity. It cannot be dismissed in any way due to someone's individual experience or even personal preference. Frankly, soberly this morning, To ignore Christ's commands concerning his church is to disobey God, to restrain the church from functioning as God intended, and worse off, to ignore God's blueprint for the church is to bring spiritual disease and spiritual ruin to the body. Over these last few weeks, we have spent a considerable amount of time together examining what the scripture has to say about the church. And as part of our study, we began last week looking again at Christ's gifts that he gives to the church. And today, I want us to examine the leadership that Christ ordained to lead his church. And what we're talking about is, is biblical eldership. And what I want us to do in our time together this morning is I want us to examine three foundational truths that Paul lays out in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 as a defense of biblical eldership. Eldership. Let me give those to you this morning. In verse 11, we're going to see Christ's appointment of biblical eldership. In verse 12, we're going to see Christ's mandate for elders. And in verse 13, we're going to see Christ's result of his design, his blueprint for the church. But as we begin our time this morning, I briefly want us to cover a number of church models that you may have experienced or even picked up over your lifetime. 
There are no doubt versions of church leadership that you have been exposed to and maybe even hold on to. The first of those is what we call a congregational model of leadership. Due to Western democratic influence, as well as an exaggerated perspective on the priesthood of the believer, there is a belief that the congregation as a whole should be the ones who vote and have the authority in the church. In this understanding, the pastor and the staff are there to do the work of ministry. And yet the decision-making responsibilities falls directly onto, the authority falls directly into the hands of the congregation. Thus, in doing so, the pastoral staff, as well as the entire church, falls into the hands of the congregation, many of which may be unbelieving. There's also a deacon-led model. If you grew up in Southern Baptist churches, you're familiar with this. There are variations to this model, but basically, you have a senior pastor whose job it is to preach on a Sunday. And then you have a group of men, the deacons, who are to carry out the work of the church, follow up with folks, count money, Etc. In this model, the deacons have zero to little teaching and shepherding responsibility, but largely serve to carry out various administrative tasks in the church or to sit on various heads of committees within the church. Thirdly, you have what they call the presbytery model. This model is seen in most Reformed churches, and as the name alludes to, mostly in Presbyterian churches. In this model, there are two essentially variations. The first variation is a group of men outside of the local church serve as kind of a proxy type of eldership for a local church. They make decisions for that church in what they call their session. And so while the church may have their own elders, the presbytery has the ultimate decision-making process and power for the church. The second variation here is where there is an acting elder group, an acting eldership with a local congregation, but they report up to or under their local or regional presbytery. The local elders there may have some kind of input and maybe have some level of responsibility in the church, but they do not act autonomously from the presbytery. Fourthly, if you grew up in charismatic circles, you're familiar with what they call the apostolic model. In this model, there exists a belief that there are modern-day apostles, just as there were in the time of the New Testament apostles. In simple terms, they would say that the book of Acts is prescribed on how the church is to be, and in doing so, argue that there is an office of apostle that serves in the church today, and that these present-day apostles have the same authority as Peter, Paul, and John. Many charismatic churches, as I said, hold to this model, which is why we also see false manifestations of the gifts of prophecy, of tongues, and of miracle working in these churches. Let me just give you a quick word of exhortation in relation to the book of Acts. It is a historical narrative. It is largely descriptive, not prescriptive. So as we read it, please understand to be careful that we don't create commands for the church that don't exist there. Fifthly, and this is a more popular approach for churches who would say that they recognize a need for biblical eldership, is they say, yes, we affirm what the Bible says, that there should be a plurality of elders, but at the same time, they don't want the elders to control the church. And so then they write into their constitution that the congregation is to have the authoritative vote in all matters. This is what we call an eldership with congregational control. In this model, the elders may have some input. They may even have some various teaching responsibilities, and yet they are not leading in the manner in which Christ commanded. So the question is this morning, With all of these variations of leadership, is there a true, one true biblical model of church leadership that Christ ordained? And to say very plainly, did Christ, through his apostles, give the church a blueprint, a design for leadership that he specifically designed for his church to function as he ordained it to do so? And I would submit to you this morning, not on my preference, not on my authority, but on the authority of Scripture. That as the Lord of the church, Christ delegates his authority 
through a plurality of qualified men known as elders to lead his church. And these men serve as an example for the flock in qualifications outlined in the scripture, and they are characterized by servant leadership. Well, let's look at Paul's defense of biblical eldership this morning. And in our first one here, I want us to look at Christ's appointment of biblical eldership. Christ's appointment of biblical eldership. And the first aspect of their appointment in verse 11 is that they are sovereignly selected. Elders are sovereignly selected. Paul says this, speaking of Christ, he gave some. Paul here begins here with this phrase, he gave some. So as we think about last week, we saw where God in the incarnation of Christ, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, we saw that great powerful picture of how he defeated the greatest enemies of God in sin and death and Satan. And as we saw last week in doing so, God gave gifts of the church to Christ as the spoils of his victory. And as Christ's subjects, he then gives those gifts to us as his body by sovereignly distributing to each one believer a unique blend of gifts and then apportioning the level, the effectiveness of those gifts to be used in the ministry of the local church. In addition here, Paul also states that as part of God's redemptive work in Christ, not only did he give gifts to the church, he also gave the gift of qualified men to the church. Paul also states here, he says that he gave some. That is to say that while every individual believer receives a sovereign distribution of giftedness in salvation, the leadership of his church is appointed to a select group of men who Christ personally chooses for his service. In simple terms, elders are Christ hand selected men. I want you to see this in a very vivid way. Turn with me to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. Revelation 1 is a passage that we looked at several weeks ago that displays Christ's active ministry in his church. And we saw this as he walked amongst his churches, ministering, assessing, and and disciplining his church. And it's after this great vision of this glorified Christ That in this vision that John then is commanded to write down what he sees in this vision. And in chapter 1, verse 19, it says this, Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things that will take place after these things. Verse 20, As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John here is brought to an understanding as to who these seven stars are from this vision of the glorified Christ. They are referred to here as the angels of the seven churches. The word for angel in the New Testament can be translated as as an actual angelic being. They can also be translated messenger or helder. This is translated this way in Luke chapter 7, verse 24, in Luke chapter 9, verse 452, and in James chapter 2, verse 25. And it's this translation here of angel for messenger is more than likely what John is referring to here. The context here leads us to an understanding of this because the individual who's referred to the angel in the church of Ephesus is the angel in the church in Ephesus. That is to say that this is an individual who is active in the ministry of these seven individual churches. So more than likely what John is referring to is that Christ is communicating that these messengers are pastors, heralders of the truth, pastors of these individual local bodies. And it's these pastors that Christ addresses are those who John says that Christ holds in his what? In his right hand. The right hand is a symbol of power in the scripture. And so the picture here is that Christ not only hand selects these men, but he is also delegating his authority to them in each of these seven local individual churches. So while these are leading pastors, each of these in these congregations, 
They also serve representatively of one of a plurality of elders in which Christ delegates his authority to his local church. What John is affirming here in Revelation 1 is what Paul is affirming here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. That Christ hand selects and he delegates his spiritual authority in and through the elders of the church. Going back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul also wants us to see that a plurality of biblical elders became the standard of leadership as the scripture was complete and the apostles passed away. He says this, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Paul here begins by naming four offices that were given to the early church. One here that's not listed that he includes in 1 Timothy 3 is that of what we call a deacon. The office of deacon refers to one who is exceptionally gifted in serving. They are men of virtue and they are recognized and appointed by the elders and they carry out administrative functions under the direction of the elders so that the elders can devote themselves to the preaching and the teaching of the word. In Acts chapter 6, we see the apostles ordain the first deacons of the early church of which Stephen himself was among them. And what's important to keep in mind here is that the biblical qualifications of a deacon are the same as an elder. It's just that their roles differ in the function of the church. Deacons are assigned to the service of the church, whereas elders are displayed and seen in their giftedness and their teaching and their leading of the church. Two of these offices, specifically of apostle and prophets, as we've seen over the last few weeks, were foundational roles to the early church, but they do not exist today. Those offices served a temporary role in the church. And as we saw from Ephesians 2.20, that God used the apostles and the prophets for a time to lay the foundation of the church in the revelation of and the writing of the New Testament scripture. And as we saw that the early church was birthed at Pentecost, and as it began to grow, God used the apostles and the prophets to receive, to write, and to declare God's revelation concerning the mystery of Christ to the early church. And to validate that message, as we saw last week, they were given signs and wonders to validate the authority and the authenticity of their message. But as more of, the, more of the apostles' New Testament writings circulated, as they were accessible to the churches, as the totality of the scripture took place and eventually became canonized, the role of the apostles and prophets went away. But there were a group of men that after the apostles' ministry would pick up the baton of leadership in Christ's church. And here Paul tells us that there are two titles that are still present in the church today. One of those is an evangelist, and the second is a pastor teacher. Now, if you may be confused as to what an evangelist is, it's not the guy that showed up for a week at your church growing up in a suit, sweating, preaching something that scared you. That's not what the the gospel, it's not what the scriptures tell us. These are men, though, that are uniquely gifted in evangelism, they are uniquely gifted in sharing the good news of the gospel. The role of an evangelist in a biblical sense is not one that travels from church to church, but rather it describes someone who has a deep desire to see unsaved people come to know Christ in salvation, as well as uniquely gifted to carry out that ministry. I think if you've met somebody with the gift of evangelism, you know it, don't you? But in our day, We might liken these individuals to missionaries, to church planters, to those who have a desire to struggling churches to see them revitalized through the preaching of the gospel. Philip in the New Testament is called an evangelist. Sometimes these men are taking, they take the gospel to an unreached people. They stay there for a time, they teach, they mature the church, they establish godly leadership, and then they move on to a place where people continually don't know Christ. We see this ministry in the Apostle Paul. 
And at other times, as in the case of Timothy, he is sent to Ephesus to preach and to teach, and then he actually stays there to become the pastor of the church there. This is what an evangelist is. The last office that Christ gives to his church is that what he says of a pastor teacher. Now look, I know what your scripture says. It says pastors and what? Teachers. But we have to understand is in the Greek context and the language, the word for and means that is or in particular. So this is best translated. These are pastors that is a teacher or a pastor in particular that is a teacher. So we would say this very simply, this is a pastor teacher. The word for pastor means shepherd. Much like the shepherd who watches over, who protects, who cares for his sheep, so the pastor must care for God's people. He has been charged with keeping watch over the flock of God. He is also described as one who is teaching. So he is a teaching pastor. He has the spiritual gift of teaching. He is able to effectively teach the scriptures with clarity, and he is also able to refute those who come into the church and infiltrate it to try to lead people away in error. A survey of the New Testament uses a number of words to describe a pastor teacher. Elder, overseer, bishop, and pastor teacher. These are all used synonymously to describe the same person. They are not distinct offices, but rather the title describes the same person and what they do. We see this in chapter 1 of Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and in Titus 1, 5, where the spiritual qualifications of elders are outlined, that the title of overseer and elder are used interchangeably. The word elder describes his office. Over descri- overseer describes what he does. So to refer to the office of pastor teacher is the same to refer to as an elder. In simple terms, pastor teacher are elders. Elders are pastor teachers. In the church, these elders can be staff elders, meaning that they are given full time to ministry. For instance, a senior pastor who is exceptionally gifted at preaching and teaching and therefore part of that local body of elders. Or an elder can be what we call a lay elder, someone who works in the world and yet is extraordinarily gifted and shows that giftedness and qualifications to lead Christ's church. A healthy church will have both of those type of elders. But the question is, is what does the New Testament tell us about the precedent for elders? I mean, is this just something that somebody thought up that would work really well to keep order in the church? Or is this concept of biblical eldership affirmed throughout the rest of the New Testament? Well, let me give you some evidence this morning that that was the pattern of the New Testament church. First of all, elders were established in every New Testament church. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel under intense persecution in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And out of this persecution, these churches are born. And then, as a result of these churches being born, there are elders established in those particular churches. Listen to Acts chapter 14, verse 23. When they, the apostles, had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So what do we see? We see an appointment of elders in every local church. And then we see a a sobriety, a sober-mindedness, a testing that goes on. Having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord. Listen, at that time in church history, there was one body, one church per city. And so there was a plurality of elders established through a process of testing, of fasting, and of prayer. In Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, we see Paul call for the elders in the church in Ephesus. Peter, writing in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through, th- 1 through 2, to the churches scattered in the regions of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Peter calls himself an elder and then exhorts the elders of each of these churches to shepherd the flock of God. Listen to what he says. Therefore, I exalt what? The elders among you. These are men in these local churches, churches who serve as elder. What? As your fellow what? Elder. 
and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. And then here's the command of the elder. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So we see as much as scripture records that elders were present in every New Testament church. Listen, this was not the exception. This was the standard. This was the true biblical standard of every true biblical church. But not only were elders in each individual city and church, the New Testament records that there was a plurality of elders in each church. Each church had a plurality of of elders. Listen to what Titus or Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. He says, For this reason I left you in Crete. For what purpose? That you would set in order what remains. What remains? And to appoint what? Elders plural in every city, what? Singular. Church leadership is defined as a biblically as a plurality of elders. And it is a crucial component to God's design, his blueprint for Christ's church. And to be a true biblical church, a church must commit to that type of leadership. Listen, I don't know what your background is here this morning. No doubt we have all picked up influences over the years and ideas around what works best, right, for church leadership from a number of sources, worldly and Christian but please hear me this morning, not on my authority, but on the authority of God's word, that a biblically qualified plurality of male elders is the design for Christ's church. But the question is why? Why is it so crucial? Why was Christ so clear through the apostles in stating that this needed to be the structure that was to be established? Well, secondly, I want to get into verse 12 and I want us to see Christ's mandate for elders. Christ's mandate for elders. Paul, continuing on in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, tells us exactly why. Speaking of the reason that God gave elders to the church, he says this, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. In this passage, Paul lays out three propositions. And for us to rightly understand how they are related to each other, we must understand the context. Paul here is not saying that elders equip, that elders do all the work of service, and that elders do all of the building up of the body. That would violate the context in which Paul has been speaking about. So the question is, what is the context? Well, go back to verses 9 through 10. What has he just been speaking about? Spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts are distributed to what? Each individual believer. And they are to be used for the education and the building up of the body. So the best way to consider Paul's words here is that they are like building blocks, building on top of one another. And this is how it works. The elders equip the saints. The saints carry out the work of service in the church, utilizing their giftedness. And then, and only then, the entire body, that local body, that local body of Christ is built up. Listen, Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, lays out the process by which the church is to serve and to grow. And it begins with the elders' mandate to equip the saints. The word for equip is the word kitartismos in the Greek. It means to mend. It's used of mending nets. It's meant to, to frame something out. It's meant to, to set something aright. It was used in secular Greek of, of setting a bone. It means to make complete. It has the understanding that the elder's responsibility is to ensure that the church, the individual members of the church, has everything that it needs to grow spiritually, to mature, to endure hardship, and to live a fruitful spiritual life. So the question becomes then is, well, how does it happen? How do, how do the elders of the church equip the saints? 
What are the primary ways in which the elders then are to cultivate this in the life of the church? Well, the book of Acts tells us. In Acts chapter 6, as we just mentioned, this is where the first deacons were installed in the book of Acts. And we are taught this through that the mandate of the elders was then to carry out or to then equip the saints. Listen to Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said this, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to save tables. So what was happening? Well, these elders, I mean, these widows weren't being served food. And so there was this commotion. And so the apostles then decide, hey, our responsibility is to preach the word. And so we need someone to carry out, as it were, the serving of tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom. So what are we talking about? Qualified men whom we may put in charge of this task. So here we see the service, the servant heart of the deacon. And then in verse four, contrast that within the work of the elder. But we, meaning the apostles, the elders, will devote ourselves to what? Prayer and to the ministry of the word. Listen, the scriptures are clear. The primary means by which the elders equip the saints is through the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. Paul says it this way in Colossians 1.28. He says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. For what purpose? So that we may present every man what? Complete, there's our word, in Christ. There is a means, and as a result of that means, there is a result. Paul says this in Colossians 1.28. It's a proclamation of the word. It's an admonishing from the word. It's a teaching every man through it for the purpose of presenting every man in Christ as what? Complete. That's the equipping of the saints. Listen, elders are not figureheads. They are not board members. They are shepherds who through their preaching and their teaching and their discipleship, through their prayers for the saints, through their tender care of the flock and their faithful oversight of the church and in their spiritual leadership, they equip the saints to do the work of service. Listen, order and organization in the church are necessary. In fact, they're commanded. Administration and carrying out ministry in the church to foster spiritual growth needs to happen. But the primary responsibility of prayer and of teaching the saints must be the paramount responsibility of the elder. To neglect these is to neglect Christ's own mandate for his elders. It amazes me, tragically, when churches boast about what they do, their status in the community, their goal of influencing social change, to be the first ones who are breaking down cultural barriers. And yet their people are spiritually anemic, starving for the word of God. The elder's responsibility to make it personal, my responsibility this morning, that I will give a direct account to Jesus Christ personally for, is the teaching and the preaching and the prayer that will provide you with everything that you need to do to grow spiritually so that you can faithfully carry out the works of service for Christ's church. I want you to see how these two provisions work together, your responsibility and my responsibility. That is, the believers of the church are, are coming together and you're exercising your unique blend of spiritual gifts. And as the elders of the church are, are teaching and they're shepherding the people, helping them to grow, then the church, our local body, is built up. We're not talking about numbers. We're talking about maturity, right? We're talking about Christ-likeness. And as the elders carry out their mandate to equip the saints, and as the body is carrying out the work of ministry, God in Christ produces results in keeping with his design for the church. Look at verse 13, and we're gonna see Christ's result of his design. Christ's result of his design. Verse 13 says this. It's for the equipping of the saints. Why? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, 
to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Paul here lists four results. Four results of the elder's mandate to equip the saints. First of all, he says here, the unity of the faith. The unity of the faith. The word for unity is agreement in, unanimity in, unity in. But the question is, is unity in what? Listen, Paul here isn't speaking of some ecumenical unity or some kind of ecumenical cause where Christians and Catholics and Muslims and unbelievers kind of set aside their differences for the sake of something that they call unity in a common faith. First of all, we know this because Paul doesn't say unity of faith. He says what? Unity of the faith. That is to say that the only true faith, the Christian faith that has been handed down to the church from the apostles as contained in the scripture. Jude, speaking of this faith, exhorted believers to contend for the faith. He said this in verse, or in Jude 3. And he said, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you do what? Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Look, folks, there's no new revelation. This is what God intended to communicate to us. We then are then to contend earnestly for it. So the unity that Paul is, has in view here or speaking of here is a blessed unity within the body as believers are taught the truth of Scripture through the elders as they come to know those truths at a deeper level with greater clarity, and as they grow in their understanding of them as well as in their obedience to them. Listen, don't let anyone ever tell you that unity cannot be found outside of an affirmation of biblical doctrine. One of the falsehoods I hear often from people from various churches in this area is, is that leadership and they have committed to preserving a false unity of a church that has nothing to do with doctrine, but rather it's a unity around a cause or some worldly thing, all the while neglecting the true unity that can only be found by affirming what the Scripture says. This is true spiritual unity. Listen, without doctrine, you have nothing. The second result of Christ's design for biblical eldership is this. He says, knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge of the Son of God. Thayer's lexicon of the New Testament defines the word for knowledge as a precise and a correct knowledge. Specifically in this context, it speaks of the true knowledge of Christ's nature, his dignity, his person, and his benefits. What we're talking about is a growing knowledge of your Christology. That is to say that as the elders teach the flock, the whole counsel of God's word, that the church in a greater and more accurate knowledge, grows in a more accurate and greater knowledge of Christ. In simple terms, our minds are being transformed into a clearer and a deeper understanding of who Christ is, the depth of his work of salvation, and his active role in the life of the believer. And as we do so, Paul says here, then a third result occurs. He says this, to a mature man, to a mature man. The word for mature speaks of one who is fully grown. They are spiritually mature in their character. They are spiritually mature in their obedience. They are spiritually mature in how they think about things. In simple terms, they are not still drinking milk. They are not being dominated by the besetting sins of the flesh. They are those who look beyond themselves to the good of the body. They are those who, while not perfect, display an ongoing pattern of life and increasing conformity to Christ. And Paul says the only way that this can happen is through the design of the elders equipping the saints. This is to be seen individually, personally, individually as you as a believer but as Paul points out next in the fourth result, it should also be seen corporately. He says this, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to Christ. What Paul has in view here is our sanctification that ultimately leads to our glorification. 
That as individual believers who, who come under the teaching of the elders, we are growing and we are growing in a greater knowledge of Christ and we are growing in greater spiritual maturity. And in doing so, our life serves as an ever-growing, as an ever-increasing picture as to the person and character of Christ. Listen, we will all battle the flesh in this life. And yet what Paul says here is that if his church will submit to his blueprint, his design for biblical eldership, he will produce in that body real spiritual maturity. One that will grow by God's grace through his means of grace until it is fully realized in our glorification. Listen, my prayer for Sola Bible Church is that when people come through these doors and they meet with you and they sit through service and they interact with you, that they say, man, there's something different here. Not in some hokey way, not in some superficial way, not in some worldly way, but rather as they see our church carrying out their unique giftedness as they interact with you that they come away with the understanding that there is a real spiritual sober-mindedness here, a real picture of what it means to know Christ, to be walking in obedience to him, a real and genuine love for the truth of Scripture, a real and genuine love and concern for people who come through our doors, a desire to minister to them, to go beyond ourselves, to, an ever, to be an ever-increasing picture as to what Christ is and how he has truly revealed himself in the Word. Listen, a church does not reap the benefits of verse 13 without first committing to the eldership that Christ has commanded to his church. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen if a church is neglectful of the preaching and the teaching of his word, of the prayers for their saints of not being offered. Listen, churches may seem really busy. They may claim to have a lot of programs. They may claim to have a lot of ministry going on, but they are falling short of the standard of Christ himself for his church. When closing, you may have two very large questions on your mind this morning. First of which, how do you know if a man is qualified to be an elder? If these are Christ's men, if he hand-selects them, how does that work? Well, guess what? We don't have to try to figure it out. Spirit in the Scripture gives clarity to this question when he inspired it. We find that out through the biblical qualifications outlined in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus 1, 6 through 9. First of all, there are always two, res two prerequisites for eldership. First of all, he must be a man. Listen, no matter what the culture tells you, no matter what the feminist movement tells you, to be a pastor teacher in a church, to be an elder in a church, you must be a male. How do we know that? Paul says very clearly, if any what? Man. Secondly, there must be desire. There must be desire. This is a subjective nature. It's, as the Puritans called, the internal call. This is the desire of the man to do the work. He says this in 1 Timothy, Paul does, 3.1, it is a trustworthy statement. Again, if any man, what? Aspires, desires to the office of overseer. It is a fine work that he, what? Desires to do. The question is, is does a man desire to be an elder? Does he desire to be a shepherd? Does he desire to be an overseer? Listen, it's not for the prestige. It's not for the notoriety. The work of the elder is hard. It is arduous. At times, it is very messy. But his desire is for Christ. His desire is because he loves his church and he loves his people. That's the true desire. And if he meets those two pre-qualifications, then he must meet the spiritual qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Again, listen, understand, we're not talking about perfection, are we? What we're talking about here is a pattern, a direction of one's life, where these men serve as the example for the flock in these qualifications. First of all, he must be above reproach. 
He must be above reproach. This is really a, a summary qualification of all the qualifications. In simple terms, it means that the man has no handle on his life. There is no handle that someone can, can take hold of and bring some kind of a reproach against him. As Tom Pennington, our former pastor, used to say, this is the Teflon man in which nothing sticks to him. Secondly, he must be the husband of one wife. By the way, I think I might just bring Jason back up and pray the prayer again because he did such a good job on this. But secondly, he must be the husband of one wife. This has to do with the man's moral character, not his marital status. It is possible for an unmarried man to be an elder. Paul's qualification here really speaks to the man's character, his moral character. How do we know that? Paul was unmarried and he was an elder. So what Paul is talking about here is it has to do with his moral character, not his marital status. But for the man who is married, he must be, as Paul says, a one-woman man. He is to be devoted to her. He is to care for her. He is to be known for sexual purity towards his spouse. He is to be known for his longevity of faithfulness and care and love for her. So you might be asking the question, what about divorce and remarriage? Does that automatically exclude someone from being an elder? It can and often does, but not definitively. It is possible that a previously divorced man could possibly serve an elder if these are possibly true. The divorce happened prior to conversion. If there has been a significant period of time after the divorce, if the man has demonstrated marital faithfulness for a period of time to his current spouse, and if there are no lingering issues that would bring reproach upon the man, that is to say he's not fulfilled any kind of obligations he had potentially in that legal declaration. Secondly, he must be sober-minded, temperate. What's this mean? It means he's not given to excess. He's self-controlled. There is a stability about the man's life. Nothing controls him. Thirdly, he must be self-controlled. What this means is, is that he has a, a real seriousness to himself. He has the appropriate priorities. As you look at the man's life, there is intentionality, there is purpose driven by his spiritual priorities. Fourthly, he must be respectable. It comes from the word used to describe the created order. It refers to a man that he has a well-ordered life. And that well-ordered life is visible to others. Fifthly, that he is hospitable. Literally, that he is a, a lover of strangers. That his home is an open home. Not just to those who are close to him, but to those he doesn't know or wants to know or even strangers. Sixthly, that he's able to teach. He must have a sufficient understanding of Scripture. He must be a student of it. He must be able to communicate the truth of the Scripture with clarity, with accuracy. And he must be able to refute those who come into the church and try to propagate false doctrine. Also, he can't be a drunkard. He can't be one who is known as a lover of or overindulges in alcohol. Look, I'm not saying that you can't have a, a glass of wine with your dinner. That's an issue of conscience that you have to obey before the Lord. But it can't be one who lingers long over the drink. Eighthly, he can't be a violent man. From the Greek, it means to strike. He can't be one who loves to fight. He can't be one who loves to argue. He can't be bad-tempered. He can't be irritable. He can't have a seething demeanor. He can't be seeking to always impose his own will on the congregation. Verse 9, he must be gentle forbearing, gracious, known for his kindness, not only to the body, but for those who come in and who are unreasonable. Ten, he must not be quarrelsome or quick-tempered. The word is peaceable. That is to say that he is not easily angered. He is not quick-tempered. He doesn't fly off the handle all the time. He doesn't promote disunity in the body. Ten, he's not a lover of money. He is free from sordid gain. He's not greedy. He's not miserly. 
He's not preoccupied with building his own empire. 11, he is skilled at managing his home. The elder's responsibility is to lead and to manage the household of God. To do so, he must first show that in how he can manage his own home. Is there order? Is there chaos? Is there a, is, is there a proactive and an imminent leading in the home? 12, he keeps his children under, under submission with all dignity. Yours might say believing that they are not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. A man meets this qualification, first of all, if his children are faithful believers, very plainly. And yet for those of his children who are not yet believers, they can demonstrate this in their behavior as being one who is trustworthy and in line with the authority of their parents. That is to say that they're not rebellious towards their parents. Someone who does not meet these qualifications is is when a child that they have to claim to be a believer is living a life that is out of control. It also means they don't meet those qualifications if they are an unbeliever and leaving in dissipation and rebellion to their parents' authority and teaching. Thirdly, it can't be a recent convert. The word for for recent here, a convert, refers to a, a plant newly planted. It must not be a new believer lest they fall into conceit and pride. 14, they must be well thought of by outsiders. Listen, this doesn't mean that in the community in which you live that know you, that they will agree with you. It doesn't mean at some level that they won't be adversarial to you. But even as they are adversarial, even as they disagree, and may even they may hate your message, as they look at your life, as they look at your character, There is nothing that they can personally grab hold of in your moral character. Titus adds that they must be a lover of good. That is one who is eager to deny ourselves and to do good to others. And it's not a burden to them, right? Listen to the first Peter chapter five, verse two. When he exhorts them, he says, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, what? Not under compulsion, but what? Voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sort of gain, but with what? With eagerness. What do we see? Voluntarily, eagerness. Nor yet as what? Don't lord it over them. But what? But proving to be examples to the flock. Titus also adds that it must be upright, just. That is to say that he is fair and equitable in his dealings with outsiders. He's not a crook, right? Right? And then I love this one, another summary statement. He must be holy. He must be one who is committed wholeheartedly to the Lord and to the truth of God's word. Listen, eldership is not a popularity point contest. It is not based on how outgoing you are or you aren't. It's not based upon how connected that you are. It's not based upon the board that you sit on or how successful your business is. You can be a tradesman or you can be a CEO. It doesn't matter if you make minimum wage or you make millions. The only qualifications that matter and that God outlines are what he sets forth here in his word. In addition, as you read that list, I'm sure that we all fall under some level of conviction, do we not? And ladies, this is not an excuse for you guys to check out during this part of this. Because the reality is what? These are all characteristics that what? Everyone should be pursuing. This should be the pursuit of every member, every local body member, every true Christian should have the desire and the pursuit of their life of these qualifications. Paul here is merely stating that the men who serve as elders serve as the example to the congregation in those things. But the second question is, that you might have on your morning is this. Well, Brad, there's one of you. Where's the plurality gonna come into? So just so you know, currently right now, there are a group of men who serve as elders who are qualified men who serve as our kind of proxy elders for a time. But listen, that is not a permanent solution. That is a temporary solution to a a, a larger progress that we want to make. So the question is, 
How are we to bring up then a plurality of elders? Well, first of all, we surely are to pray, are we not? Right? As we agree with the scripture, as we agree with Christ that this is the model, that this is the structure that he has set forth. But listen, as we are praying, we can't sit on our hands. We must be a church that is committed to training up biblical elders. Our commitment needs to be that, to training up of biblical elders in the church. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says to Timothy, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to what? Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Four generations of pastors, four generations of elders in that verse. Listen, the primary avenue that God has given to train future elders, future pastors, is the local body, is the local church under qualified pastors, elders. As I said before, this this is how I was trained and affirmed. This is how every man who comes up in the church and who has a desire for eldership is to be trained. Listen, I think it's tragic when churches go five, ten years without any elders, sending men off to be trained and never to see them again. Listen, God has given qualified men to the church to train the next generation of elders, and that is the model that he will continue to do until he returns. And listen, by God's grace, let that be your prayer. That by God's grace, according to his design, he will carry out that faithful process at Sola Bible Church. Let's pray. Our Father, we are encouraged, we are challenged, we are transformed in our thinking to bring our own thinking in alignment with your word this morning. You bring great clarity as to how your church is to be structured through biblical eldership, qualified men who are to teach and to love, to care for, to pray for the flock, to equip them, as it were, for every good work in the church, to help them utilize their giftedness in the church. And as a result of that, you build up the body. You create real, true spiritual unity. You create real, true spiritual maturity. Lord, help us to be a church that has a strong desire, not only just the desire, but the commitment to continue to train up the next generation of elders, ultimately for your glory. And in doing so, may they show themselves by the work of your grace and the work of your spirit to be those who you hand select to be those who are in your right hand. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.